Good evening. Welcome to the September 18th regular board meeting for the Marion City Schools. Uh, please rise and we will we'll state the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Veronica, please call the roll. Mr. McKinnis? Here. Mr. Ratliff? Here. Mr. Weibling? Here. Ms. Dyer? Here. Ms. Kay? Here. Thank you. We'll turn now to the superintendent's report. Thank you, Madam Superintendent, and to the rest of the board members. Good evening. Um, I actually wanted to just take a moment, because I know we have a couple of things that came up that we wanted to recognize some of our students. Um, we'll make sure that uh, they get their recognition awards, but I just wanted to open it up because I know a couple of people have things that they would like to recognize students for. I'd like to start. I would like to uh, congratulate the Harding High School Marching Band. Uh, they received a superior this year for their um, competition at OMEA adjudicated um, performance. Uh, this is their 34th year uh, that they will go on to state. And it's a really a wonderful testimony to Jacob and his staff, as well as the legacy of Rick Baird and Don Wolf and all the kids, all the parents and their guardians. Um, I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart um, you guys know I love the band, and uh, it's always fun to see you, and I congratulate you on this win, well, this superior. Um, I would like to recognize the girls volleyball team who uh, took second place in a tournament over the weekend in Sandusky, so woo for women's sports. Thank you. Um, I have a student I'd like to recognize who is a seventh grade student at Grant Middle School. His name is Carter Blauser. Um, he, as part of his Eagle Scout project, gathered volunteers and they uh, refurbished over 100 music stands. So I believe they straightened them, they painted them, um, and cleaned them to get those ready for our mu music students. So just wanted to shout Carter out and to thank him and his volunteer crew and for his Eagle Scout project for thinking of Marion City Schools. Anyone else? Oh, so That's is he at Harding? So we've got to get him a pen. Yeah. He's at Harding. Grant. Grant. Yes. Yeah. I'll make sure that they get those. Awesome. All right. So moving into my uh, report, our first, um, actually I have two parts to my report tonight. The first is an update on the Harding Sports Complex project. And I'm going to ask our director of facilities and operations, Jake Grau, to come up. Um, this is really an exciting project, and I know that I didn't spend a lot of time on it last year. Mr. Mazzi was a big part of that committee, but I'm really excited about the opportunity to reimagine and re-envision what our Harding campus not only looks like, but what it can provide for several of our sports teams, and not just our sports teams, but also the resources that it will have available for our staff, um, for our families, and for the community at large to be able to come to our campus and use the sports complex. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Jake and um, I'm gonna pass these around so you guys can have a picture as he's going through. Uh, Jake? Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me up here this evening. Um, so this all started back in January with Steve Mazzi asking the question, why is baseball and softball not playing at the same facility? And so Thank we went you. through the whole discussion of why baseball is a grant. Um, and he goes, you know, the, the facility needs to be at Harding where the students are at. And we need, to, we, need to, we need to look at building a complex that both baseball and softball can be proud of, but also it can help facilitate for soccer that's out there. If football ever wants to go back out to practice out there, we'd be adding a concession stand slash a fitness center of sorts um, out there as well. Um, so in February, after we talked about this in January and February, we came up with a committee of myself, Steve, uh, Sean Kearns, Jill Hecker, uh, Brett Hall, Brett McCurry, and Jeff Bolander. We all got together, 
talked about what this might look like, came up with some options of everything that they want to see um, in this facility. We then, I contacted MSA Architects who they actually designed the Harding Stadium. Um, so they wanted, to, I, we wanted them to create a vision package um, for our complex. And what, what, what you see in front of you is the actual finished vision package. Um, in March, um, we gathered everybody together along with the architects so that all the group members could tell the architects what they'd like to have. Um, in May, the architects sent us three options. We got together as a group again, and the three options really didn't work for what we were wanting. So we gathered as a group, went out to the site, which is out by the soccer field, and actually walked the grounds and kind of envisioned what it would look like. So we came up with one last concept and sent it to the architects, and they drew that up. And what you see is, is what was our final uh, product. Um, and they delivered this final product. It was about July, or I'm sorry, August 11th um, is when they delivered this final project. So if you want to see, so the reason why we, on the first page, the reason why we picked this location, if you look at the actual drawings of the high school from 20 years ago, the uh, football stadium was actually drawn to be out there. So it has all the infrastructure, all the blue lines are drainage, the red is uh, sewer and water. So all the infrastructure is out there for this complex that we're looking to put, put in. Good on the last page, Brian, gets a good picture of it. So after all said and done, this is kind of what it's going to look like. Uh, Sean Kearns was very adamant we keep the practice fields. So we designed it to go around the practice field so it can still be used by our youth in the community, but also who knows down the line, maybe they want to practice um, out here a couple days a week, along with the, the concession stand there with locker rooms um, that can have a facility for soccer as well. Um, all, the, all the sidewalk going around. And so that, that is the vision of our group over the last six to eight, about eight months of work. I had a question on, on this schematic. I don't see where the micro farm is. Am I? It's right yeah. here. Where is it? It's, it's, we, we designed around it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. It's right here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, just making sure. Yep. Because on the first one that I'm looking at, it doesn't look like there's any. Yeah, it was uh, so the, the first drawing they actually the couple of first renderings didn't have that, and I said no, we we got to work around what we have there right now. Okay. So really, the purpose of today was just to provide the board an update because we have you know made some progress into at least envisioning what this looks like. Our next step will be you know gathering some of our it, broadening our community our committee a bit more to include some community members um, because again. Another piece of this is there is a walking trail that can be around this. So again, the whole community can use this and we don't really have a lot of those um, in Marion. So again, we're looking at not just baseball, softball, but look at all of the ways that we can actually utilize the space for our students. And we know that athletics is important to this community. We know our extracurriculars are important to this community. So um, our next step is going to be like I said, working, developing that committee um, to determine how we're going to now fundraise for the project. But we at least wanted you to um, be knowledgeable about the work. So if you, you know, hear things that we're working on it, that will be our next step. And then we would come back to the board, um, you know, and keep you updated as that process goes through. Um, Jay, question, mm -hmm. you said a, a fitness center of sorts. Yeah, I guess fitness center may not be. It's, it's um, locker room, concession stand, restrooms for that complex out there, and for you know, hopefully the community at large to use. Like Olympia said, we want we can envision utilizing this, the cross country trail as, as walking trails mm -hmm. for community members as well. Gotcha. Okay. So you're looking at forty four million to. Five million. So it's complete. Package, Almost yes. six. Okay. Talk about the phases. Yeah. So phase phase one in that 
package. Mm -hmm. That is including everything to, to be able to play ball. So everything you see on those two fields is included in the first the first phase. That's a, I think it was roughly one and a half million dollars. That's to do uh, so, so they can actually play dugouts and everything. The final phase would be to add the concession stand, restrooms, locker room, along with the concrete walking paths to each facility. Um, that is the that is phase two, and that's another roughly two million dollars, two and a half million dollars. It was actually split up in three phases to begin with. Phase one and phase two was like $150,000 apart, and I didn't see a point in phasing out, having three phases when we're talking that much money, only being $150,000 apart. What would, do, what would this do for us in terms of hosting? Uh, you're already nodding your head. Yeah, so <laughs> as you can see, the 23 is right there, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be a great look from the highway. We're hoping we can host OHSAA tournaments there, mm -hmm. um, along with you know travel youth ball, because um, it's going to be um, turf infield, uh, grass outfield. So rain outs, unless it's actually pouring down rain, is non-existent. Okay. And we're actually, we're hoping to partner with some other some other groups if they want to use the field as well. I assume that it could be used also for OSU, Marion Tech. Uh, for their intramural or other yeah. kind of, yeah. if they wanted to add sports to their program, that would be an attraction to them. Yeah. And when you say walking uh, track, that, that could encompass uh, uh, the entire community um, and, and some exercise uh, places along uh, that track. And yeah. right now it's the cross country track is what you're talking about. And that's it's about a three mile. It's three miles, three and a half, 3.1 round trip. Uh -huh. Yep. And we do maintain that all year round. And that cross country, that whole scenic mm -hmm. kind of scientific mm -hmm. kind of stuff out there is underutilized as it is. Yeah, so it goes through nice. all the woods and everything yeah, out there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so. And I think there's bur oaks back there yep. that need to be protected as well. And Sean would be the guy to put you know signage mm -hmm. out because he knows all that. Yes, he does. All down through there. From from parking lot to the softball field, how far of a distance is that? So that was a concern. I'm not going to lie. We looked at that. We actually, the concern is, and I don't know the actual distance like, right offhand. The concern was we had baseball field turned a little bit sideways at one time, and the concern from the architects is it's got to be within so many feet of a restroom, actually walking feet of a restroom to, to be legal. Um, so that's why we had to turn baseball. We brought softball towards baseball just a little bit um, and put the restrooms where they are. It's, it, the drawing doesn't, drawing doesn't do it justice. It it's, looks further than what it actually is when you go out there. That's why we had to go out and visit the site and walk the site to see how it's going to feel. Well, because if, if I'm parking you know, anywhere in these lots, there's not a direct access to that field so I got to walk around whatever buildings we got to get back there there's no way to get back there so if you're elderly or handicapped you got an extreme hike so to go see a game where right now you're just well they're paved so that, get right out of there there's gonna be I mean it can be paved all they want if you're on crutches or a cane it takes you a while to get back there I mean that's way out there so I don't know and I know Sean wants to keep these fields but mm -hmm. Uh, and I think why he wants to keep them is because we've already paid and it'd be a, a cost, costly thing to put the field right next to the other one. I think that's what his position was. But, man, these are, these are out there. So I don't know, you know. I don't, I don't see it as being that far. And as someone who sometimes uses a cane, that would not be a difficult distance as long as it's flat. Uh, there's, there's, I mean, there's parking there. I don't know how many yeah. spots I can see right there by the concession mm -hmm. stand restroom. And I don't think we need to get into the weeds tonight right. because this is a long way. This is conceptual. This is, this is all conceptual. Uh, if we get down community members and others uh, that will give us that kind of input that Mr. Ratliff just spoke of, mm -hmm. and perhaps it would have to move in some direction or another. Yep. So, I, I just applaud the concept mm -hmm. yep. and, uh, uh, and and know that. There's a lot of work yet to be done, both in raising uh, private <laughs> funds to, to build this mm -hmm. and uh, 
also to change it to fit some of the requirements of the community. It's an exciting plan to start off with. Yeah. Thank you for this. Yep. Thank you. So when's the next meeting though, Jake? When's our next meeting? I set one for October. I can't remember. We added one for October. Yes, yeah, okay. October, I think it was just before the board meeting. Okay. Thanks. All right, and moving on to the second um, part of my report tonight, I've asked Dr. Kenny to come and just give an overview of our evaluation process because I know we have had um, several discussions and I think it's important for the board to know of some of the uh, revisions or things that we've done of how we're going to evaluate our staff this year. So Dr. Kenny is just gonna give us an overview and then um, this, Friday when we share the update with you, all of these links with the documents, we can share those with you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam President. Good evening, board members. Um, this is one of our goals that we have talked about since um, probably mid-year last year, talking about how to conceptualize the evaluation process in a way that's easy to understand and uniform across the district. And so I kind of tried to put a lot of things into one slide so you could see different aspects of that. So the evaluation process is just that, it's a process. And our focus with that is growth of our staff members, growth of our administrators, and trying to improve the process along um, the plan. So when we use this, we wanna look at challenges and strengths of each of our employees. And so we kind of have two-fold system. One is through the Ohio OTES program, which is Ohio Teachers Evaluation System, or Ohio Principals Evaluation <coughs> System, which you see in the green and the blue with the ineffective developing skilled and accomplished graphic. That is what is prescribed from the State Department when we evaluate a teacher or an administrator that's on a license um, that works with students. The other side that's kind of diagonal is a PERFORM evaluation. That's a tool that we have through the Power School operational system, and it mimics things within the Ohio education uh, system as well. So areas of focus are similar in that we're asking the teachers, what is your vision? What is your uh, focus for work? We're asking principals in uh, supervisors, cabinet members, different things. So what I want to try to explain is what the difference is between the two systems. The OTES and the OPES um, are for licensed professionals, teachers and administrators. Cabinet level administrators, we use the PERFORM evaluation. And you can see that both of those systems ask for a growth plan, a meeting, two observations, walkthroughs, and a summative meeting. So they're similar that we ask um, are all administrators to go through the same process. The essential components that you can see on that slide kind of just explains it a little bit more in that both systems have the same components. There's a full evaluation cycle and a modified evaluation cycle for teachers based on their level of a skill, their um, data that has attached to them from year to year, or if they're on a continuing uh, an improvement plan or a what am I trying to say um, growth plan thank you or if, the, if somebody has asked for um, a continuous um, contract so then there's also a district evaluation committee you see off to the side this is something that um, teachers and administrators together jointly meet several times a year to discuss those things that you can see that are highlighted in blue, whether it's OTES protocols or local decisions. We talk about high quality student data. That's a requirement of the evaluation process. And we also talk about calibrating so that we're all doing the same things in the same language and the same format. So you may walk into a building and the principal has you know, an electronic system where he or she is keeping data. 
Everything that is official goes into the OTES system that's run by the state. Um, same thing for administrators at the cabinet level. We have things that we can add in or uh, use as artifacts. Those can be added into the perform system as well. So even though they're two different names, uh, we can mimic the same process. The other two additions are what well, we tried to make very clear for both administrators, uh, for us cabinet members that are trying to evaluate principles per se, according to a timeline, so we're in adherence with all of our dates and relevant um, contract stipulations according to the law. And then the other one is a, a timeline for teachers, for supervisors and principals to use. So we know that at the beginning of the year, we, have to do, we all have to do growth plans, and there's a deadline for that, and we ask all of those to be done by September 30th. And there's a side to this that we created that's Evaluators have to do, teachers have to do, because it's a system that we can both work together on. And so this is a document that we shared with administrators this year, um, just with friendly reminders and timelines. And so we're just really trying to be um, cohesive in our approach and in our recommendations, all the same unified. Um, I think that's it. Pretty much a, a kind of short overview. You may have already answered this uh, off the top of your head. What would you say that we as a district do the best when it comes to evaluations and what are some of the things that you're focusing on that hey, we need to clean this up? I think right now one of our really good success points is that our evaluation committee, uh, we're having really um, intense conversations about what do the teachers expect, what do the administrators expect, and can kind of coming to um, consensus about how do we want our system to work and so that the general understanding is that it is a growth process and we're trying to look at the holistic picture not as far as like a gotcha or you didn't do this um, and so one of the things that we're also working on this year is the professional development for teachers because some of the feedback that we've been getting is that they're not sure how to best upload artifacts or how to get their point across when they have to prove I have classroom management skills or I have focus for learning. So those dialogues have been really important um, from last year and continuing to this year. So I feel like we're really coming together on what our expectations are together. So I think that's a really strong strength that we have going on for us right now. And the fact that um, we've taken the time to align these processes. So if you're looking at an administrator um, at district office, we're all using what um, the focus areas from the superintendent's evaluation. So we're all t talking the same language now. And then I think just the overall process of keeping it in the forefront of our administrators and our teachers and continuing to come back and talk about these things. It's not something that we want to allow to slip under the radar or to, to go by the wayside because it is a growth process. And I think the more conversations that we have around that with that mindset, the better off we'll be going forward. So are those conversations and addressing some of the weaknesses that our own staff and administrators have seen in the way we do things then? Yeah, so before we have any of our evaluation committee meetings, I have a meeting with the MEA president and we talk about what do we want to put on the agenda. So it's a joint effort. And so then one of the things that we talked about at our most recent meeting was teachers have a voice and so we want to hear from you what questions do you have, what comments do you have that you think that could make the process better? So another example of that would be the teachers had an idea for using a common lesson plan that was co-created by the evaluation team a couple years ago, but needs updated to reflect OTES 2.0. And so if we do that and we all agree like this is a lesson plan, it's gonna um, talk to every single standard that we might see in an observation, then if the teachers agree to that and we'd agree to that, then we're talking the same language. Thank you. Okay. It feels like you guys have been doing a lot of work on this, and I appreciate that. Commend the work. Yeah, thank you. And that concludes my report. Okay. All right. Mr. Hainer. Yes, ma'am. Madam President, tonight I get to share with you the beginning stages of talking through um, the, Ohio, the Ohio improvement process, or what we call the OIP. Um, what is the OIP? Number two. 
Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Here we go. So when we look at the five-step Ohio improvement process, it develops and supports the entire system as a learning organization. It provides data to plan for both staff and student improvement. It builds capacity through support and accountability. It sustains an open and collaborative culture, and it supports systems for ongoing improvement. So to the left there, that is the Ohio five-step process. There's five steps in the process, and that center bullet meaning the supporting implementation. There are three key, the district leadership team, the building leadership team, and then you have teacher-based teams. So when all three of those collaborate together in a common collaborative supporting implementation, we get positive student outcomes. What I'm going to do is break down each step for you. You're going to see two slides for each one. The first slide is going to give you district and building level teams. That's what they're doing, um, looking at that identifying the critical needs. So in number one, we're identifying the critical needs. Uh, the district and building level teams, they're going to review completed one plan and one needs assessment. Each building will complete a one needs assessment that's looking at their uh, critical needs within their building. They verify that that root cause or critical need an, uh, analyzes and priority needs are connected to the data. And they identify data gaps and provide more information where needed. The teacher-based teams are going to review building and district one plans. They're going to collect data at the classroom and team level regarding adult implementation and student. And that's key because in step three, you're going to see where that adult and student implementation are key because we want to know what the adult's doing and we want to know how the students are receiving that information. Could you give me an example of a critical need once it's identified? Yeah, our students are not performing well in, a, in reading, so our reading scores are going to be low. Mm -hmm. So a critical need is going to be that our students need more informational text. Mm -hmm. So then one of our goals would be how are we going to get our students that informational text. Okay. And then we're going to monitor it through that whole five-step process, looking at it, um, reflecting on it, do we need to adjust um, as we go through that process. Thanks. Helps. Does that help? Oh, Perfect. Focus for me. Yep. Um, identify data trends and barriers and communicate findings to the building level team. Open communication is the biggest from the TBTs to the BLTs to the DLT and that we're talking and that we're communicating. So in that second step now, we're going to research and select evidence-based strategies. We have identified in number one what our critical needs are. Now we're going to research um, on a district and building level, research and select evidence-based strategies that are aligned to district and building goals, and we're going to communicate evidence-based strategies to all stakeholders. Our teacher-based teams are going to take that evidence-based strategies are in alignment with the needs of all learners. The evidence-based strategies and adult and student measures are clearly understood by instructional staff. Moving on to number three, that's when we're going to plan for implementation. The district and building level teams, action steps, priorities to implementation, check the evidence-based strategies are aligned to the district and building improvement goals. We're going to examine adult and student measures and assess resources. We're going to pinpoint and eliminate evidence-based strategy barriers, and we're going to create support structures for our TBTs. Our TBTs are going to do the training for implementation, evidence-based strategies is completed. Assessments and measurements are clearly communicated throughout each team. Barriers are communicated to building leadership team. And teachers clearly understand the data collection expectations. On that number four, that's when our plan is going into we're going to implement and monitor it to see that it's working, provide teachers access to needed resources. We're going to collect and analyze that evidence data tied to adult and student measures of instructional strategies. We're going to assess evidence-based strategies impact on student outcomes, and we're going to provide feedback in a timely manner. Our teacher-based teams are collecting data in real time and in consistent format. They're considered implementation fidelity and opportunities for teachers to improve implementation. They're going to ensure instructional strategies are accessible to all students, and they're going to review, analyze, and share data in exclusive groups frequently and that ex inclusive groups are going to be their TBTs and their teams that they're going to share that data with. At that final stage of five, we're going to examine, reflect, and adjust 
district and building level teams post implementation. We're going to review cycle action steps. We're, we're going to review the effectiveness of support structures from the TBT, the BLT, and the DLT. We're going to identify adult measures and student outcome data trends, uh, considered areas of progress and declines in the next one needs assessment and one plan. Teacher-based teams are going to review effectiveness of support structures through the TBT, BLT, and T, uh, DLT. We're going to identify data trends, and we're going to communicate the areas of progress, um, and we're going to improve. Improving is consistent and ongoing. I've asked two people to come with up, and that is Sam McMasters is our Director of Teaching and Learning, and she's going to talk about those TBTs, DLTs, and BLTs. And then I've asked Greg to come up as well um, to talk about um, data. Well, <laughs> when in doubt. When in doubt, look back. Um, the, uh, I can't think of the name, so I apologize. Performance index. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Performance <laughs> index and how we get that. Sam? Thank you. So that was a very quick overview of the Ohio improvement process. In reality, it takes us a long time to go through cycles. Mm -hmm. And what we have focused on this year is making sure that we have an established district leadership team that consists of head principals from our buildings. There are teacher representatives from each building. There are um, there's a representative from our Unified Arts, one from Special Education, and our um, Central Office District leaders. So we all come together to decide, discuss and decide. We talk about our data, we make decisions about what we want to focus on as a district. I sent you a slide deck a couple weeks ago in our weekly update that had that last DLT meeting where we talked about the Ohio improvement process and establishing district goals. A small group from the DLT was able to meet in July where we went through the Ohio improvement process and planned that August meeting. So at the August meeting, we had the opportunity to walk through all five steps. We had individuals and groups discuss what makes a good step one, a good step two. What are we looking for? So really, they identified what those look fors were in each of the five steps of the Ohio improvement process. So that transfers back, Kevin talked about then, that information going back to your BLTs and your buildings. And then that information gets to your teacher-based teams. So when we talked as a DLT, we talked about goals in literacy or ELA, math, attendance, and whole child or whole educator as we focus moving forward. You can, next slide. So we worked with our teams to talk about the steps of the, or the five steps of the process, and we set some expectations from the DLT to our BLTs. And that was at each building and department. So we included the teaching and learning department. We included the student services department. We are all following the Ohio improvement process. So those five steps of identifying our needs and then researching and planning, implementing, monitoring, has to happen in all of the decisions that we're making as a district and as each team. So we agree that each building and department will follow the five-step Ohio improvement process. That we will use data to develop building department goals that are aligned with our district goal areas. So there are things within teaching and learning that we will do to address that district goal of improving our performance index for ELA and math. We also will identify the adult and student implementation measures and choose evidence-based strategies that align with the pillars. So Kevin talked a little bit about strategies as he was going through about, about selecting evidence-based strategies. When we surveyed our DLT members, we asked them, what areas are we doing well? What areas do we have challenges with? And what we found was, and this was pretty consistent, that most of our staff understand that there are five steps to the OIP process. Some of them have been through that. We do really well identifying our needs. We have lots of data that support those decisions. We do a good job at researching what are those evidence-based strategies. We do some planning. We do some implementing. And then we might get stuck in that implementation phase where we continue with the same strategies or we plan and then something happens and winter break comes and we come back and we start over. So we start the process over before going through the five steps with the strategies that we selected. So that's really where we're focusing this year. We worked with our principals last week on how do you identify those evidence-based strategies? What do you do once you have those strategies in place? And then what's your next step for monitoring and progress? So on the next slide, it talks a little bit about what we are asking 
building leadership teams to, to provide back to the district leadership team on a monthly basis. So we are asking them to report their building goals on a monthly basis. The reason for that is, is because we may end up changing a goal for some reason because of the process that we've gone through. Not likely in literacy and math, but we may change our strategies. So we've also asked for a monthly summary of their TBTs with clear identification of where they are in the OIP process. Mm -hmm. So you might have a second grade team that goes through three cycles between now and winter break. You might have a first grade team that only gets through two cycles. Or you might get a fourth grade team that gets stuck on step three and is like, we don't know what to do, but we're gonna know that in October. We're not gonna wait until December, January to say, why haven't you finished a cycle? We're gonna know that on a monthly basis for every team in the building. We asked principals how many TBTs do you run in your building? Because it's gonna vary based on staff and, and how they've organized. The second question we asked was how many of those TBTs completed a full OIP cycle for last year? Some of them, not all of them. So then we asked what were the barriers? Why didn't we get through the five steps? So we have work to do with our teams. That's where we're focusing. They understand the process. They've identified what makes each step of the process strong. And then we're able to, on a monthly basis, as a, as a district leadership team, to identify where do they need support? Where do they just need a thought partner? Where do they need, or do they need ideas to address what those goals are? So if they're getting stuck back on step one and step two, we're gonna intervene quickly so we can get them over that hump, get onto the second step of the process as a building and as TBTs. So I'm gonna ask Greg to come up and just share our Samantha performance report. index. Yep. Um, That's a lot of information. <laughs> the um, critical needs, I'm focusing on that for the moment, can that be at a classroom level, a building level, or is it district-wide level that we're identifying a critical need? That's a great question. So we are going to identify district level critical needs, which align with our, which is where our goals come from. Mm -hmm. The building then creates their goals based on district goals. So they have to be in alignment. They don't have to be exactly the same. They're going to be in alignment. So if I have a, an ELA goal that we're going to increase our performance index, the building's going to have an ELA goal that says we're going to increase our performance index. The classroom teacher is then going to dive into that classroom level data to say what Evidence-based strategies do I need to put in place in my classroom? So my goal may be I'm going to implement um, classroom discussions or I'm going to implement um, eliciting prior knowledge because those are evidence-based strategies. So I'm going to do that so that when I do my CKLA checks, are my students improving in the skills? that's gonna get us to students reading on grade level and performing on our achievement assessments. So how many critical needs could you have going at one time since they sort of sound like I mean, one reading, one math, so, and then your building may have like an attendance goal. So we're talking mostly about reading and math? That's your achievement, that's gonna be our achievement goals. There could mm -hmm. be a critical need in the future that's different than that. Absolutely. Right? Science or something yes. else. If it's content based, but typically it is, if our kids can't read, they can't access the right. science curriculum. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that they're accessing curriculum and mm -hmm. able to, to make progress in those areas. But you're exactly right. For now, we're not being measured on the state tests on science. We're being measured on ELA and math. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. The monthly summary from the TBTs, how are they expected to do that? Is the whole group coming back together? Are they just firing off an email? So how it is a happen? work in progress right now okay. because we will probably edit it a little as, but it will probably be a, a Google form and then we will ask for specific things. We will ask for their number of, of TBTs that they have in the building, what step are they on in the process, so they will list where they are in the process, um, and then their building goals, and then there'll be a place for them to add what, what evidence-based strategies they selected for their teams. Is, go ahead. Is this a new approach, or have we been doing this in the past? Um, since I haven't been here before, <laughs> I don't know how they gathered information previously, but they did share information with DLT in the past. Information was shared from buildings, they did it through emails, um, and it was collected in that way. What, so with your TBTs, how often do they meet? Most buildings meet at least twice a week. I think the middle school meets four days a week. And that's the TBTs? Yes. And then L the yeah. BLTs, how often are they meeting? BLTs are either meeting twice a month or once a month, it depends on the building. Okay. And then the DLTs. Meets once a month. Okay. 
I think I can answer Mr. Ratliff's first question about what well, we've done this before. Is it new? I think we've been the Ohio Improvement Plan yes. a number of times, mm -hmm. but uh, it's the fidelity at which we were lacking in those early years, right. uh, going through the motions and not really uh, having the fidelity to mm -hmm. implement it the way we should have. And so I think what you're saying now is you're monitoring it, making mm -hmm. sure the cycles are followed, and, and letting people know if, for example, if they're not done, the cycles after a year, what, what's the reason? Right, why? and we'll never get to that point because there, there won't be, be an opportunity. It's a there could be a and, and it's very encouraging. I will say from the first two meetings that we had, it's very encouraging where our staff is and understanding the process um, and being able to identify what those look for are. Um, our frequent contact with building principals are reinforcing what's happening out in the, in the buildings, and yeah. it really is exciting that we are all aligned um, and making progress. Do we have a state representative that, that we have liaison with on the Ohio Improvement Plan? I don't know the answer to that. Or maybe State Support 7 is probably what Oh, our st we do about. use our State Support mm -hmm. 7. Steve, Steve yeah. Short with State Support 7 is involved. I guess involved. that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, is, and I guess, does the DLT or district people ever participate in the TBTs? They do go out to buildings. I know um, Krista, our literacy trainer, goes out to the buildings. Greg has been out with TBTs, um, with their DLTs and TBTs, I think. Um, and so we do have the opportunity. We are invited. There's no way we could make it to all of them, but we are certainly invited to participate. No, in those. I, I understand that. I'm just saying if the problem is sticking to the goal, because I see this as more of a head coach situation, some assistant coaches and the actual players. Don't, I, I mean, they're meeting four times a week. You guys are meeting once a month. I guess I'm missing why the, the head of the operations aren't going to some of these ground floor meetings and saying, hey, this is what's going on instead of waiting until the entire month passes to say, hey, we got a problem. Because that's the expectation of the building leadership team and the, that they are monitoring that within the building. They will contact us to come out if they need support or help, but the expectation is, is that our TBTs are running on a regular basis and our building leadership teams are running on a regular basis so that they're addressing those needs as they come up. And they get stipends to participate do, right. in that building. No, I, I get that. I, I guess I've never understood why the district level people are never in the classrooms watching some of the stuff like the building leaders are to say, hey, here is the, what the district's emphasis is. You hit that. You didn't hit that. We need more of that. I, I, I mean, I mean I you guys aren't seeing it. I don't understand how you guys can correct stuff that you're not seeing firsthand ever. I, I wouldn't say that we're never in the buildings. I'm out in the buildings a lot, so I would have, that would be a... No, I, I mean... The way you're presenting is they, they have four a week, and sometimes we might hit them. I understand you can't beat all these because there's a lot of them. But I don't understand. It seems to me like some of the disconnect, and I'm not talking right now because it seems like you guys are more, you know, pedal to the metal and trying to get this corrected. But some of the disconnect in the past is it's been lost between the DLT and the building at some, at some level. I, I hear you. you know I, I, mean? I do think that we put measures in place to prevent that disconnect. Okay. Because I feel like the building sometimes have went this way and the district's been wanting us to go this way and we're not going the same way. And some of that is because I believe the district people, okay. maybe in the past or what we've done in the past, I don't know which one procedurally or people-wise, but haven't been like here to see the troubled areas. You know what I mean? Like I, I firsthand I, to see. I hear you. Know you. I, mean? I, I would disagree with where we are right now no, I'm, and the alignment. Get, and, and so I moving forward, I, but I'm just, you know, mm -hmm. okay. I think moving forward, I think we are in a, a position where we are in alignment and we, that alignment is we've put measures in place to prevent any of that disalignment from happening. Okay. What's the plan for if and when a TBT or a BLT finds something that really works mm -hmm. in terms of best practices? So if, if they find, some, hey, this is what we did, is there an end of the year opportunity for everybody to share successes failures the whole thing DLT that's, when you come to DLT and that's working you're going to share out to our DLT okay. that what's and working. end of the year and I would say I, we also so, sorry, whenever we find out is yeah that, so okay. I also think that throughout the year we've been encouraging moving forward and some of last year that as we find those things that, that are working we are asking our staff to present to other staff members through our professional learning avenues because that's what we want. When we have something that's working, we want them to share. So I know Jen Wellman and Krista met with all of our coaches and, and as they're finding things that work, 
we want to get those on the next PD schedule so that they can share that information with other teachers so that they can replicate it in their classrooms. And it just comes to mind, if we do experience success as a result of these strategies that we have implemented, to not then jump at five other different things instead of just hammering this one home for a couple years mm -hmm. if need be. Mm -hmm. It's working, let's keep our focus on this so it doesn't start to lag and then we need to revisit the same problem three or four years down the line. Right, and so I think that's, we've talked to principals about identifying your top 10 strategies because they're not gonna work with every group of kids. That's the other, you might have five strategies that work really well for English language arts with this group of, of students and you get next year's fourth grade class and you're like, wait a minute, we have to step back and figure out something not different. Working. But that's the good thing about having that autonomy to select the strategies that work for the, that group of kids. And now that you say that, and perhaps the plan already exists, at the end of the year, if the, the, the grade below could share with the, the teachers above, mm -hmm. this is the critical need that was identified for mm -hmm. this group of students in this building, and again, when they go to the grant, everything gets mixed. Right. But that there's carryover with that information so they don't have to reinvent the wheel every single year and they know yes. what their strengths and weaknesses are. Yes. So just an end of the year summative experience that the, the teachers could have to share with one another. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I get to talk about um, the specific ELA and math goals that are um, part of this process. And you've heard the term performance index, and I may say PI, so I apologize if I shorten it. Um, but the performance index is something that the ODE uses for the local report card. It's used in a couple different um, components. It is used in the achievement component where that combines everything. But the one that we are breaking down is the gap closing component. Um, and the reason we use the gap closing component was because it breaks it down by ELA and math separately. And you can also see all the different subgroups um, for each one of those subject areas, okay? Um, so what we did was looking at the performance index for last year, you can see there our ELA and math, and then the state has a long-term goal for the all students subgroup of 100, um, and that's in several years from now, but the long-term gap is the 100 minus our 22-23 PI. So for ELA, that gives us a gap of 33.6. So to determine our goals, we took 10% of that long-term gap, and that's what we would like to increase by this year. And the reason we used that as our calculation was because it's something that allows for consistency across the district because all buildings have a different starting point for each subject, and it makes it so that it's an attainable goal, and it's a sustainable goal, okay? Because if you shoot for the moon the first year and you reach it, then getting that exact same goal the next year is gonna be harder, okay? So we want something that is attainable this year and it's sustainable. And talking with several people about these goals, these are, um, these are good attainable goals. It may not look like it's a super high amount, but depending on the building and depending on the subject area, it does um, increase, there, it has a variable increase in, in what it is. Um, and the reason PI is used is because that takes into account all of the students. It's not just those above proficient, okay? It, it takes into account all the levels of proficiency on the Ohio State tests and the end of course exams at the high school. Um, so based on the, these, this chart, our ELA goal for this year by June 2024, our ELA gap closing for all students, the performance index <coughs> for all students would increase um, from 66.356 to 69.716. And for math, it would increase from 56047 to 60.447. Now, if you want to know the calculations that go into PI, I'm more than happy to talk to you about that, but I didn't want to bog you down with, with those calculations. 
but that's that's the goals that we have set for the ELA and math for this year and then the buildings have their goals set based on their individual performance index. So with the ODE reorganization and they'll only be doing um, a few things now, um, teacher licensure and um, boundaries for school districts. That's my understanding. So when this all moves into the Department of Education Workforce Development, will these so the local rubrics and everything that we are working Yeah, the local on, report card is part of Ohio Revised Code. So if okay. they want to change it, they're going to have to amend ORC. So, okay. Yeah. Who will be responsible that, that? Will that go into the, then the governor's office? I would all probably fall under the governor since that's who's over it all now okay. when it changes. That 10% that number, did we come up with that or was that the state coming up with that 10%? No, we came up with that number based on wanting it to be something that's attainable, something that's sustainable, but okay. that is something that was used in the past for gap closing. Mm -hmm. um, before, gap, gap closing has changed tremendously in the last couple years. But before, you could get a point in the gap closing for increasing your PI 10% based on your long-term goal. Um, so it's not something that's uncommon um, or something that's unheard of for, the, for that kind of calculation. And do we, if accomplished at some point, do we then reset it? For the class or for the, the grade level? Or? So the way that these goals are set, it's, it, it won't happen until the spring. Yeah, end the of end. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, so we, but just, just so you know, the, the buildings, especially at the elementaries, because I was involved in one uh, BLT and I've had some conversations with some other principals, because at the elementary level, this would only include third, fourth, and fifth grade, and they want to also include K-2. So they're looking at iReady, um, the achievement components of iReady um, to help guide classroom goals um, and building goals based on that. So it's not just the OST, but if you if you hit some of those lower goals, that will help yeah, yeah, you know yeah. hit that hit that okay. upper goal. Yep. Thank you. If you and Samantha and the whole group were asked to present to the board your findings throughout the school year, whether it's monthly, quarterly, however, wherever you think we <coughs> have enough, what would you, again, if you were asked to do so, how would you see that playing out? What would you present to us, say, hey, this is what's working, this is not working, this it's too early to tell. I don't, it might be too vague of a question, but. From my, from my mm -hmm. standpoint, I can easily do it from the fall, winter, and spring diagnostic assessments through iReady and through NWEA at the high school. Um, for, for the nitty gritty kind of, you know, that kind of classroom stuff, that would have to come from discussions with the BLTs um, and the TBTs as they, as they have that cyclical kind of discussion going up to the, to the DLT. So that's a little harder, but from my standpoint, I could easily give you the, the three the benchmarks. Okay. <laughs> I would say too, like a mid-year report would be a good time to reflect on processes, what's working from our establishment of the DLT, how, how these are working, but also what's the feedback that we're getting back, what are those, I mean, I, I'm happy to do that mid-year, like a semester time. How about the BLTs as well? Mm -hmm. If they would come, this is what we're working on, this Absolutely, is what they would do that okay. willingly, yeah. To keep it on our radar as well, so we're, mm -hmm. We don't lose sight of it either. I yeah, can do that. I think that's a good suggestion. We can certainly yeah. do that. Okay. So we we did. I know at least last year we did the bo the beginning of the year, middle of the year, end of the year. But we really just did the quantitative piece. Mm -hmm. We didn't add the qualitative. So we certainly could add those pieces in, especially since we're revamping and realigning all of these processes. Okay. Thank you. All right, treasurer's report. We need uh, to approve, we need a motion to approve the board minutes from August 7, 14, 21st, and the 22nd. So moved. Second. <clears throat> Discussion? Call the roll, please. Mr. McInnes? Yes. 
Mr. Weidling? Yes. Mr. Ratliff? Yes. Ms. Dyer? Yes. Mrs. McKay? Yes, motion carried. Item B, financial approvals. Motion to approve the following financial items. August financial reports as presented, fund balances, checks, and financial report. Um, item B, the fiscal year 24, permanent appropriations, exhibit A. Item C, fiscal year, revised revenues, exhibit B. Do I have a motion? <clears throat> so moved. Second. Discussion? <clears throat> Call the roll, please. Mr. Weibling? Yes. Mr. McKinnis? Yes. Ms. Dyer? Yes. Mr. Ratliff? Yes. Mrs. McKay? Yes, motion carried. We have uh, a few donations. Treasurer recommends approval of the following donations for Harding High School Robotics Sponsorships. $100 from Two Blues 97.5, $100 from the OK Cafe, and $500 from James and Teresa Mead. Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Discussion. I would just like to thank these organizations and these um, individuals uh, for their kind donations, and uh, thank you. Call the roll, please. Mr. Weidling? Yes. Mr. McKinnis? Yes. Mr. Ratliff? Yes. Ms. Dyer? Yes. Okay. Yes, motion carried. We come now to the hearing of public. The Board of Education recognizes the value to school governance of public comment on educational issues and the importance of allowing members of the public to express themselves on school matters of community interest. Public participation is a time set aside for the board to listen to public comments, but it is not intended as a time for dialogue. The board offers public participation to members of the public in accordance with the procedures uh, stated below on this agenda. The board applies these procedures to all speakers and does not discriminate based on the identity of the speaker, content of the speech, or viewpoint of the speaker. And we've had one person sign in, Tony Weber, if you would come to the mic, please. And we give you three minutes to speak. Thank you, everybody. I was appalled the last board meeting when another board member, when speaking, told another board member they were speaking from privilege. We live in the land of the free and the home of the brave, not privilege. How can you say that when you recite the Pledge of Allegiance every day at every meeting? Not one of those words talk about privilege. Privilege and the Pledge of Allegiance contradict each other. Some of the words in the pledge I will go over right now. One, flag, the symbol of freedom for its citizens. United, we all come together. Republic, the people, their representatives in government. One nation, all Americans. Indivisible, our country is incapable of being divided. Liberty, freedom for the right, freedom, the right to live one's own life. Justice, qualities of dealing with people fairly. And for all, meaning everyone, not just the few. So please, do not call one of us privileged. By doing so, you are in direct, call, direct contradiction to what you say every meeting. We are all Americans. Please, let's act that way. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we come to um, agenda confirmation. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Then we'll go on to the approval of the agenda, item B. Uh, motion to, I need a motion to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. Discussion. Call the roll, please. Mr. McKinnis? Yes. Mr. Whiteling? Yes. Ms. Dyer? Yes. Mr. Ratliff? Yes. Ms. McKay? Yes. Motion carried. Under old business, we have none. New business, um, district leadership uh, team member stipend. Superintendent recommends the approval 
of Jennifer Lane to be hired for the district leadership team, paid a $500 stipend. I need a motion. Motion. So, no. No. I'll second. Okay. Discussion? Call the roll, please. Ms. Dyer? Yes. Mr. Weidling? Yes. Mr. Ratliff? Yes. Mr. McKinnis? Abstain. Ms. McKay? Yes. Motion carried. Item B, district substitute teacher aid hire. Superintendent recommends the approval of Sean Dyer to be hired uh, for substitute teacher, teacher aid. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion. Call the roll, please. Mr. McKinnis? Yes. Mr. Weibling? Yes. Ms. Dyer? Abstain. Mr. Ratliff? Yes. Mrs. McKay? Yes, motion carried. 2320 item C, the 2324 Interscholastic Athletics Program. Superintendent recommends the approval of the Marion City Schools Interscholastic Athletics Program for the 2324 school year. Um, do I have a motion, please? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion? So, so, I'm, so I'm very happy that girls wrestling does it seem mm -hmm. that that's going to be a go? I hear that that is one of the most exciting things that we're, we're adding as far as our athletics and things are concerned. And um, so I was pleased to, to see that happening. Yes, and they are very excited too, the girls that are going to be wrestling. Sean had them ready to come today. Uh -huh. um, but I would actually like to recognize that inaugural team at some point at a board meeting so mm -hmm. I would like to bring them so they could be formally recognized but we do have enough girls to start a wrestling team which now is exciting. Our, and we have the coach and everything mm -hmm. okay awesome. that's gonna be exciting all right call the roll please Mr. Weibling yes Mr. McInnes yes Mr. Ratliff yes Ms. Dyer yes Mrs. McKay yes motion carried item D Provisional changes to board policies, administrative guidelines, and forms to comply with House Bill 33 resolutions. <clears throat> Superintendent recommends the approval of a resolution to make provisional changes to board policies, administrative guidelines, and forms to comply with House Bill 33. And there you see the language. Um, <clears throat> uh, do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Discussion? Call the roll, please. Ms. Dyer? Yes. Mr. Weidling? Yes. Mr. McKinnis? Yes. Mr. Ratliff? Yes. Mrs. McKay? Yes. Motion <laughs> carried. 10A, Shane Cove Consulting. The superintendent recommends approval of a consulting contract between Marion City Schools and Shane Cove to assist the higher parting singers. This is for the amount of $13,000. So moved. A second. Okay. I do have a couple of points I would like to make. Uh, some questions, and maybe Veronica, you can help me with this. Um, has this contract ever been bid out by Harding Music Parents? Do we know? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Um, do we know if Harding Music Parents can reimburse us for this $13,000? I know that in order for, the, for it to be paid, they have to um, reimburse right. us. Right. Have we received financial statements from Harding Music Parents as we've asked? Um, the last statements we probably received, that I received, probably was last January. January of 23? So um, something I'm, I'm a little bit concerned by is I know Harding Music Parents gave $10 gift cards to the band to go to the Florida trip, um, which amounted to roughly around $1,000. And now we're looking at $13,000 um, for a choreographer. Um, you know, I do have in that frame of mind, or that frame, I have some equity concerns um, and since we are not getting statements, financial <coughs> statements from Harding Music Parents, um, I'm concerned about how they're divvying up their money. So I will be a vote no on this. 
um, but, those are my concerns. But this, I think this is the same mm -hmm. amount in person they had last year. Right. Yeah, but they and don't I think you are a yes. Yeah. No. So I, I guess I don't. So guess they're not I'm bidding missing. it out. They're not bidding it out. Well, they didn't last year, and you voted right. yes. So I guess I'm, 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 I'm very concerned, I'm concerned this is an attack at the music boosters. No, I'm not. And well, I, that's all I heard. Well, here's here's also the deal with hiring music parents as a booster organization. They only allow parents and guardians of students currently in those programs. Athletic Boosters does not. They allow anyone to be a member of their booster organization. So when I see $1,000, I guess the change then for me, Rocky, is that the Harding Music Parents gave $1,000 total, roughly, to the band kids, and now we're going, they're going to spend $13,000 on a choreographer. That is, but is it, isn't it's that, an equity concern. But isn't that the choice of the booster club of what they're boosting? Because well, if for they're instance, not equitable, and if, for they're instance, not, if we're not getting the, financial the, statements. The athletic boosters boost whatever sport. Mm -hmm. They could get 500 here and 20,000 over here. I don't, I don't think it's our, uh, if, if their books are correct, and I, I'm not we disputing don't what, what she's saying like. or anything like that, but I don't think they're uh, acting illegally, nefariously, anything like that. I think they're they're doing this. This is the same thing they did last year. Nobody had a problem with it. I don't know why you're having a problem with it now. And I, I don't see the problem. They gave them a thousand bucks for a bus trip, so they had ten dollars to, to do whatever. I don't I don't see it's an apples and bananas comparison. It ain't even oranges. So I mean this is crazy, but that's your vote, okay. Anything else? Call the roll, please. Okay. Um, Mr. McKinnis? Yes. Mr. Weidling? Yes. Ms. Dyer? Yes. Mr. Ratliff? Yes. Mrs. McKay? No. Motion carried. Item B, student furniture grant middle school. Uh, this is in the amount of 1100 excuse me, $117,440. I don't seem to be able to read it out. <laughs> One hundred seventeen thousand four hundred forty-four dollars and twenty-nine cents. Uh, it is budgeted through ESSER two funds, ESSER three funds. Superintendent recommends approval of an agreement between Martin Public Seating and Marion City Schools for student furniture at Grant Middle School. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion. Yep. Go so. ahead. Okay. Did we have a whole bunch of furniture within the last right. year? Yeah, Grin. This is where I think so Veronica yes. said that this, this finalizes this, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's nice furniture, though. Mm -hmm. I think that, and, and uh, Jay could qualify this, I think they focused on Grant and GW. GW, then Harding. Because they didn't get tables, yeah. all the furniture when the buildings were built. They kind of got left over, so... That was where the focus was on those two buildings, and then cafeteria tables at Harvey. Okay. Mm -hmm. Call the roll, please. Um, Mr. McInnes? Yes. Mr. Weibling? Yes. Ms. Steyer? Yes. Mr. Ratliff? Yes. Mrs. McKay? Yes. Motion carried. Item C OSBA strategic planning in the amount of $13,000 from ESSER funds. The superintendent recommends approval of a contract between Marion City Schools and OSBA to lead a strategic plan development process. And you see the various attachments there. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Discussion? This is where I... <laughs> After everything that was just presented with the Ohio improvement process, and that is no small process to undertake at all, that's what we should be focused on. I don't think, and it, they're, they're almost parallel in terms of what the, the process is going to be, identifying critical needs, getting evidence-based strategies, implementation, follow through, what works, what doesn't. We're at the classroom level, the building level, the district level, literacy, math, attendance, whole child, everything I think is included. I, I think as a staff for the teachers and the district leadership team, we've got enough on our plates already before we bring in a whole nother thing that we're going to focus on. I think the, the Ohio improvement process is plenty for our staff to, to really hone in on. 
Um, I don't think we need to bring in an outside organization to let us know what our critical needs are. To, and I'm going over the scope of the OSBA strategic planning service. Again, it sounds very similar to what we're already planning on doing. Facilitate the process of identifying and defining critical issues, strategic priorities, goals, and actionable, measurable objectives that will move the district toward its vision for the future. I think we just had three of our staff members explain that extremely well. We have literally hundreds of education professionals in this district who are more than capable of coming together and putting together a strategic plan for this district. But is this, just, is this for the board? Yes. This is a board focus. That's why I asked at the end if they could present us. So we are also, I, I don't know if any of us, yeah. I wouldn't disagree with what has already been identified as some of our critical needs. I cut you well, off, I, sorry. And I think um, with there be, being a possibility of three new board members coming on, what, what better way to equip that new group coming in than to align what the board is supposed to be doing with um, and understanding and, and um, defining the role of the board. I just think it's important that that happens, um, especially considering that a lot of board members don't um, consider training to be an important aspect of being a board member. So I think the, the focus uh, being a board member is crucial and as we define those responsibilities I think if there were um, strategic uh, type assessments I think it's important that that happen for this board uh, you know for me I think uh, there's already a strategic plan that has been put out prior right, right that we have yet to accomplish so I, don't, I mean I don't know that we need we can identify you know behaviors being a problem curriculum being a problem I mean we know the problems we're not sticking board, at though. something I mean the board knows the problems I don't think no. we need to spend 13 grand for some uh, group to come in and tell us what our vision should be we should have that vision we've lived in this town we understand what the problems are if you don't then you probably shouldn't have been on the board I think this is it was already defined by prior boards before us what we should be doing. They haven't changed, even when we did the equity audit and stuff, when we asked, do we need to change policies? No, that was the answer. No, we don't need it. We need to start getting to where the rubber meets the road and getting serious, not in theory of people coming in and giving us a bunch of words that look good on paper. We already have the stuff on paper. We need to start getting to the brass tacks and making sure it happens. It sounds like uh, the group that presented tonight is serious about the plan they have in, in, in front of us. I just think it's too early uh, because I think we have a vision as they came in uh, last time and all of us kind of agreed in some aspects that those are the, the common issues that we all see us going. Mm -hmm. So I think prior boards have kind of given us a vision and I think it it is still we haven't accomplished that those visions and we're still working hard to try to do that and I think they have set up a plan where we can keep going I don't think now might not be the time to redo a vision when we're just getting started with this group's vision I mean the superintendent just came forward and she's starting her vision I don't yeah. think we and using our old vision she's she's developing her own I don't think now's the time to redo it and all that but well, I just, That's think, just my I just think the board, this board position. needs work, and with the possibility of new people coming on, um, I think that's important. Um, I think for me, the training that I received through OSBA um, is is crucial, and I think um, we do need uh, evidence base and theories to help us decide and determine how to lead this district. Um, it's not, um, the dynamics of the board have even changed from those people that you referenced that have been here before us. Um, and a lot of water under the bridge is no, happening. I, I understand that, you but, know, but, I'll but let for Ted, me. Ted, go ahead. But I just think like when a board sets it out and the strategy, if you look at the board's pillars and so forth, I don't think they really need corrected very much. So I think, the, the strategy has been going forward and it, it's a board's position not to come and every time that someone's elected to rechange the shift and focus, you gotta start 
at some point getting behind no, ideas and just that. flooding them down the, the river and, and doing it. So No, I'm saying if we, when this occurs and if this occurs, it will be a document for whomever is sitting in this area um, in January to have some type of an idea, a blueprint that this is going to happen and they can be a part of that development. That's all I'm and saying. It'll take, I'm saying, it'll take a while to get it developed. I think you all make good points. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing this a long time and uh, organizations that are functional uh, do strategic planning on a regular basis. It's been six or seven years since we've done a strategic plan in the one that you said was adopted. I was part of that. but. Dynamics have changed in the community. Administration has changed. Uh, board has changed and will change. Um, I, I think it's also broader than what was presented tonight in the OIP. That's an internal view of what we need to be doing. I think what we as a board help uh, the community strategize uh, with what we ought to look like as a district and we talk about inspiring community. We ought to hear from the community about how we ought to inspire them. And look at the barriers that uh, are, are in the eyes of others that view our district. So I, I think it's, it's much more than an internal look. And I think the strategic planning process will include community members, staff members, and others that aren't focused merely on the academic piece, but a, a much broader view. So for that reason, I think it's a very important process to bring the board together with a vision mm -hmm. of what our district should look like three to five years from now, and then we should do it again. Uh, it's a, a never changing uh, process, I think, to do strategic planning. So if you have a narrow view of what strategic planning is, I, I think that's wrong. I think <coughs> uh, a broader view of what, what they're, we're trying to accomplish here. And so I think $13,000 is, is well spent. I agree with you, I have plenty on our plate, but we that's what walk. we're here for is to to look into the future, um, mm -hmm. just as we do a five-year forecast and like, every and year, we should be looking at our strategic plan and seeing what we're, we're accomplishing. That's my two cents. And I think, you know, we're just coming out of the pandemic. We know things have changed in our community. We know kids have changed coming to back to school and returning. Mm -hmm. So we know all of these things are happening, so we can't really afford to be in a vacuum about what's happening in our community. There may be needs out there we're not aware of because, you know, it's just the way education is. We're, we're kind of siloed off, unintentionally so. And so having a strategic plan, having those discussions with our community is gonna be really important to move our district forward so that, you know, they know we're listening, that we're not creating board policies and curriculum decisions in a vacuum and you know just patting everybody on the head and saying this is what we're doing you know when there could be other things that we need to address within our community we can't address them all you know we cannot fix a lot of things in our community but we can address some things that maybe we haven't thought about um, even you know I won't talk any more about it but there's a lot of things I think that OSBA can bring to the table for us to think about. They can ask those hard questions that, you know, you're, to your point, Mr. Weibling, about bringing somebody that, we, that is working for us. They can't always ask those hard questions. They need to be, not all of our administrators, not all the people that you have thought of that could do a facilitation, they may not live here in the district. So, you know, unless you're in the community and you're going to events and you're, you know, beyond a game, um, you know, being on a board, um, being, you know, on these nonprofit organizations, talking to people, we really don't know, other than anecdotally, what people are thinking of us. But, but can, I just, so, can I add what you, just what some, you just, I just want to okay. clarify some okay. points here as I was listening to this conversation. Um, really, a strategic plan is exactly what Mr. McKinnis said. It is that long-term vision. The OIP process that we discussed, that, that could change year from year, year to year. We might be focused on reading and math this year, and we might focus on another aspect of it next year. That's a continuous improvement process that is developed to be changed each time. 
And I would argue that there's no successful organization, whether you're talking about education, corporate, that doesn't have a strategic plan. And that really is what the board helps to drive and craft together. Now, I have been charged with you know, rebuilding trust in the community, involving community stakeholders. Community stakeholders aren't involved in our OIP process. That is just like was mentioned, an internal process. This is going to help us set those long-term what are the, we have to be 10 miles ahead of where we are. And we also continue to hear, or I have heard since coming to the district, we're reactive, we're not proactive. By working together and incorporating all of the voices in the community, the voices in the school, and not having the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, people where we have to work and have these relationships, you have an outside person come in who facilitates that as a safe space, and then that person helps us get that together. So. I support we need a strategic plan. I have not seen a strategic plan. I looked for some, they're outdated. We've had a lot of things that have changed. Our community has changed. We've had a pandemic that has occurred in this community. Um, I would like to develop that shared sense of responsibility that it's not just the school that participates in the strategic plan of the district. It involves everybody in this community. So I just wanna say I support it. They're two different things the OIP process and district leadership team goals and things like that is not the same as a strategic plan with your three, five, ten year uh, vision for the district. I just think that's where you and Kevin, I think you two are already doing that. And I trust you to do that in terms of the meetings you have with the different community groups around. And I, I think that that's part of the, the responsibility in terms of not just developing the, the vision for the district, that is ultimately with the board. But I do, I know you are already doing those things. And I don't think that we need to, again, just I hate to repeat myself, to bring in somebody from the outside that I, I think that we have so many fully capable people in this district who can already do that. And many of them, they're here, even if they don't live in the district, how many hundreds of days are they in this district? I, that's, my trust lies with it. And we've worked with OSBA. It's not a, a Cheryl's name's on there, and she was great when she came to talk to us. It's not, it's not anti-OSBA, it's, it's pro-Marion, if you will. I, I think we've got the people who can do this. I, 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 for me, I, I, I guess I understand the difference. I, I just don't think we need it. Uh, in fact, I think part of your interview process, you went through the pillars. Everybody had to. Nobody stood in front of us and said, these pillars are wrong. I got a different vision, or you need to update them. I just don't think this needs to occur. I definitely don't think we need, if it needs to occur, we don't need to spend $13,000 doing it because we can do it ourselves. Uh, that's part of being up here. Uh, and most boards just, you know, so we're clear, most boards are planning in the spring and summer to hit the fall. They don't come up with strategic plans midway in a year, in a school year. Well, they I just don't. don't. You, I don't think you understand Did the length the of calendar? time. This will probably take us a whole year to get right. in place. Right. Because there's a lot of things, that the steps are outlined here that would need to be done and making sure that voices are heard. Right. Okay. All this right. Is a, this is just another waste of $13,000. This is what this is. Being spent by a customer, I need to spend those funds. But well, I mean, we could find other stuff to spend on than just having a, a group of ladies come in and tell us what we should be doing or saying, hey, let's work through this. You really want to I call understand it a group that. of ladies. <laughs> it was really? a group of ladies. And the three that I have is a group of ladies. They're right I'm here. There's saying, three of them. These are professional. Okay, the professional ladies that come in, they did it. They are ladies. We had one. Guy. Okay. No, it's three. In. It's three in. I know, here. but we did. The, the group pillars. of ladies come in, and she's going to tell us, "Hey, here's what you need to do, and work us through some ideas. Whatever yeah. you guys want to spend thirteen grand on, apparently this important. is this is the most important thing we got going." So. Yep. Okay. Veronica, call the roll, please. Ms. Dyer. Yes. Mr. McKinnis. Yes. Mr. Ratliff. No. Mr. Weibling. No. Mrs. McKay. Yes. Motion carried. Item D. East Therapy LLC. These are new business agreements and contracts out of the general fund. Superintendent recommends the approval of the contract between Marion City Schools and East Therapy LLC for virtual speech therapy rates services at the rate of $90 per hour up to 22 and a half hours per week. Do I have a motion? So moved. 
22 and a half hours, did you yeah. say? Okay. Second. Discussion? Did Are we, we have able, for the good. sake of the public, just a brief explanation as to why we're doing this in terms of the casework? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, Thank you. So we have a shortage right now of our speech pathologists, our speech SLPs. Um, and so this virtual contract will allow us for those students that are appropriate that can participate in virtual hours. That way they won't get behind because if we don't provide the services to students, we will get in the hole and we'll have to owe them hours, um, back hours to make up the hours missed. So um, this contract, we would, I mean, we can cancel it within 30 days. So we are still actively looking to hire um, an SLP a full-time SLP, but until we get that person, we would need to um, contract with virtual speech services because our caseloads are getting high. And so, again, we had more last year than we have this year, and we still have students that are um, continuing to qualify for speech language uh, therapy and services. And the caseload, correct me if I'm wrong, is still within the parameters. We haven't gone over that. This is what right. we're trying to avoid. Yes, we're by very doing close. This. Gotcha. But again, okay. when we get you know our students in and a lot of initial evaluations will happen at the beginning of the school year. So we're anticipating and trying to be proactive and have a plan in place. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Veronica, call the roll, please. Um, Mr. Weidling? Yes. Ms. Dyer? Yes. Mr. McInnes? Yes. Mr. Ratliff? Yes. Mrs. McInnes? <coughs> yes, motion carried. Item E, Harrison Boilers. The dollar amount is 152 thousand seven hundred and forty one dollars and thirty two cents it is budgeted as our capital improvement superintendent recommends the approval of the contract between Marion City Schools and Gordian for the hot wire hot water <laughs> hot water <laughs> boilers at Harrison Elementary do I have a motion so moved second discussion just want to reference Veronica's notes prior to the meeting. Uh, thank you to Jake for doing the due diligence and save the district about $100,000. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jake. All right, call the roll, please. Mr. Widely? Yes. Mr. McKinnis? Yes. Ms. Dyer? Yes. Mr. Ratla? Yes. And Mrs. McKay? Yes, motion carried. Is there a need to go into executive session regarding the consent calendar? Okay. Are there any amendments? Okay, so uh, consent calendar approval. Consent calendar approval, all matters under the consent agenda are considered by the board to be routine and will be enacted by the board in one motion in the form listed below. The board will follow board policy 0165.1 section E in regards to the consent agenda. Superintendent recommends approval of all consent ad agenda items. Employment is specifically conditioned on sub and on subject to um, successful background checks, receipt, and final administrative review of all application records and receipt of all necessary documentation. So we will do a motion for items B, C, D, E, F, G, H, K, I, J, K. H, I, J. Yeah. What's the L? K. K. L. L. Okay. Items B through L. Do I have a motion? Nope, I don't need a motion. You need Call the roll. I do need a motion. Move to approve. Sorry. I'll second. Okay. That goes all the way to which L? L. L. Call the roll, please. Mr. McInnes? Yes. Mr. Weidling? Yes. Ms. Dyer? Yes. Mr. Ratliff? Yes. Mrs. McKay? Yes. Motion carried. And I would like to welcome our new treasurer. This is Jolene Carter, if you would like to just stand and wave. <laughs> <laughs> so she will be starting technically December 1, and she'll be here at our meetings just to kind of shadow Veronica, and we hope it for a very smooth transition. Congratulations, we're happy to have you. Thank you. Welcome. Great, thank you. All right, uh, board announcements. Um, we will probably have a few other meetings scheduled. Um, 
other than the ones for October 2nd, State of the Schools, October 16th, November 20th, and December 18th. All right. We are going to go now to committee reports. Uh, Kelly, were you going to try to schedule a meeting on the 23rd or the 29th? Or, or 19th for my goals. 20, oh, yeah. What the It's a note on there. Which one is it? It's right below the, the board meetings, the oh, potential dates. Oh, I'm sorry. Dates. Yes. 23rd. So the 23rd or the 19th, um, we need to schedule a meeting, a special board meeting to go over um, goals for Olympia. Um, so if you can all look at your calendars. I can do either. I, what days of the week are those? Is 18th is a Thursday, Wednesday and a no, 23rd is a Monday. Thursday or it's a what? Thursday October and a Monday. 23rd? The 19th is 19th is a Thursday. Thursday, the 23rd okay, is 19. Monday. <coughs> yeah, I, I will, it'll, okay, I could do. I'm usually yeah. good on Mondays. So yeah. October 23rd? That's Let's do October 23rd. The, well, Tara's Tara. yet to weigh in. Tara, are you good on the 23rd? Did you weigh in? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. October what 23rd, time? 6 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. So. And that's just going to be a special meeting to set goals. Mm -hmm. <coughs> mm -hmm. um. Got to my calendar. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Okay, six o'clock. All right. Awesome. Okay. All right. Committee reports. Okay. Extracurricular. I believe you guys met. We reported last time, I think, didn't we? Okay. Yeah. And you have met since. Okay. Um, buildings and grounds. Did you met again? Mm -hmm. Buildings and grounds only meets quarterly. <coughs> quarterly now. Um, and this, I think, mm -hmm. kind of takes up. And Ted and I have a communication meeting on Wednesday. Um, anything with curriculums next curriculum? week as well. That's okay. Wednesday, I believe. Yeah, but I I did want to um, bring up um, the, and I think you may have it on the agenda already for the state of the schools, the literacy success team, and um, that was a Laura Detweiler's group that mm -hmm. is a. Uh, funded by a grant, um, which includes uh, our staff as well as um, other community members like uh, Diane Watson. And I think a while back we talked about um, Read for 20. Mm -hmm. And um, but it's my understanding that that um, grant. This is the last year for that grant with uh, early childhood education. And but I, I but I can wait. I just want to throw it out there and. The Let's Read 20 is not supported by not that let, grant. Mm -hmm. Not Let Read 20, not that. The um, whole uh, literacy success, yeah. which includes our boot camps in the summer, right? It, it's the, pre, the kindergarten mm -hmm. summer camp. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of, are we trying to, and I don't need an answer They'll uh, be able today. to do that next summer. They'll be able to do the boot camp mm -hmm. and... And um, Veronica, doesn't some of our staff members' salaries also, isn't that we a part? We have a middle school coach that mm -hmm. comes out of that. Mm -hmm. So we got to, do we have yeah. a plan? I do not know the plan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I do know um, when we talk about all those great things that we're doing for literacy, Let's Read 20 is one. And then um, I attended the meeting just this past week where we talked about um, Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. And um, we have 2,362 kids registered in Marion County and uh, only six of the 88 counties have a higher percentage than we do. So I found that group to be uh, very interesting and I, I found that um, Krista and Laura have done a really good job of facilitating 
uh, that and getting the community in, which I know is uh, one of your favorite things is when we have that community involvement. So <laughs> I, I want to know, um, you know, I, I would love to see um, where we're going with that and if there's another grant that we can get. Um, mm -hmm. I know Mr. Weibling likes that early childhood stuff, especially where literacy is concerned. And I am heartened to, to hear that we can still do those boot camps. So. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then um, the, um, I talked to Dr. Bolden today. Um, he is having a forum for any parents that are uh, listening um, on Thursday. Um, he has some really good key points that he's going to um, invite parents in to talk about. One is chronic absenteeism. Um, he only at two o'clock today, he only had three people who were registered to come to that forum. Um, it's a Google Doc on the Harding uh, webpage. Um, I encourage parents to come and, and talk to him. Um, three key points, and I think it's something that he wants to see uh, done ongoing. So that forum on Thursday. I know that there is a <coughs> volleyball game at home on Thursday, so there's some mm -hmm. conflict there, but um, that to me um, would be a great opportunity to come and talk to the new um, high school principal about some of the things that parents are finding. You know, the, it's an open kind of a conversation and um, three people, which he said he was still gonna have the form regardless of if it was three or 33. So that from six to eight mm. at, um, I think it's right here. Um, and uh, you can register using that uh, Google Dot. And then last but not least for me, um, I, um, I met a young man uh, by the name of Kevin Boyer who um, deserves a shout out for what he did with one of our kids at a football game. He gave a kid a camera. He gave a kid a camera and the kid was hurt and was unable to play. Um, so he gave this kid a camera and he said, okay, just take pictures. And so what uh, Kevin did was he let this kid take pictures. He took about 100 pictures at that game. And um, he is, and we're presenting on Wednesday to Theo Collins at Grant Middle School. We're presenting him with this little photo book that he made for Theo. Um, and you never know what Theo's going, if, if Theo becomes a photographer, you know, <laughs> I want him to say, hey, Miss Dyer did it, and I want to give her my, no. <laughs> but if he becomes a, a photographer down the line, it's a mentorship of community members, and um, which um, makes me um, proud to be a mentor, because you never know what a difference you make in kids' life. Well, you guys know, because you're making a difference every single day. <coughs> so I've talked to Mr. Saban. We'll be there Wednesday, 1030, and we're going to, present Theo Collins with this uh, faux tag book and um, Kevin's going to be there and it's going to be a nice little thing. So. Okay. Um, I haven't heard from Johnny if, we're, if we have a DEI meeting yet. Um, finance, I'm sure. Are we going to meet? It'll be before November. Yeah, Are you guys five-year forecast yep. due in November, so uh, yep. finance yep. will be meeting in yep. October, no doubt. Yep. So when you get, go back to diversity and equity, because you know I just got lambasted because I said privilege. Mm -hmm. um, you guys um, talking about the equity audit. Um, mm -hmm. Can we contact Johnny or mm -hmm. get something scheduled? Yep. All right. <laughs> And policy? Policy did meet uh, on September 13th. Uh, we're still working on the policy about um, uh, volunteers and uh, how uh, a volunteer might rehabilitate themselves if they've had some criminal mm -hmm. record in their past and we're having important counsel read yeah. that. And, yep. and so that's, a, that's an important thing, but we're going cautiously because it's very important to know you're putting a volunteer in the presence of a child, you gotta make sure that uh, we're doing it right. Uh, we also talked about a policy which is a, uh, relates to job-related expenses uh, in terms of having receipts and so forth. That's sort of a, 
uh, a mechanical thing for the uh, finance department. Um, we're, we're also looking at, uh, uh, well, you saw you tonight, you adopted and we talked about the OD re being restructured and changing our policies to reflect that ODE is no longer ODE as of October 3rd, I believe. <laughs> mm -hmm. It'll be called something else. And then uh, we, we want to talk about, and we'll probably do this uh, during that special meeting we just sat up, set up on October 23rd, was to uh, talk about whether we need advisory committees for the superintendent, appointed by the superintendent, or whether they are board appointed uh, committees, which makes quite a bit of difference in the law in terms of having to have uh, notice of committee mm -hmm. meetings and comply with the sunshine laws and so forth versus an advisory committee is not required to do that. So uh, we want to talk about what the board's pleasure is uh, on going forward on, on having those committees structured. Um, and then we, we also talked about uh, policy on uh, using uh, private vehicles for student uh, uh, transportation uh, as it occurs sometime. So that's uh, okay. what we did to talk right. about the policy committee meeting. Thank you, Ted. Um, anything on the horizon legislatively? <laughs> I would direct all of you to be reading your high school board journal. There are many, many things that are coming down the pike at us, um, including vouchers, more vouchers, you know. So um, there's a lot of good information. Um, and then we get the legislative um, update from OSBA once a week as well. So those are the things we need to uh, watch for and advocate as much as possible um, for our students. On that end, I would like to see us um, schedule a meeting at any time, open invitation with uh, Representative Tracy Richardson. She's on the Education Committee. She's um, advocating changes to our social studies curriculum that I think we need to be aware of. Um, I would like to invite her to just see some things in the district. Um, not the not always the good and not always the good things, but I want her to really experience a day here um, or a half a day. Um, I think we should be wide open as to when that will be because I know her schedule is busy. But I think we need to start having um, our state reps uh, come into the district to see, so they can see how their policies are impacting us. So. Um, student achievement, Tara. I think I really did. Theo through. Collins. Yep. Mm -hmm. All righty. Uh, anything else? Okay, we'll go to the first reading of board policy, um, job related expenses, and um, the policy is there for you to read with the changes. The committee is working, that's working on this, recommends that we update the language and the policy to reflect that there is no reimbursement. Or any type of amount of, of any amount if the employee does not re provide a receipt. So, all right. Now we come to nearly the end. I need a motion to go into executive session for item one: um, appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, etc. Do I have a motion? I have one. So moved. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Yeah. All right. So, call the roll, please. Mr. Widely? Yes. Ms. Dyer? Yes. Mr. Ratliff? Yes. Mr. McKinnis? Yes. Ms. McKay? Yes. So, we are going to go, be going into executive session. Uh, there will be no um, action following that time. Uh, so we are adjourned. Uh, I wish everybody a great adjourned. night. Nope, we have a motion. No, you come to adjourn when you come out. Okay. Duh. But I wish everybody a great evening, safe travels. Um, we will see you again in October. So have a great evening. Yay. All right.